Well, let's get started with this session. Uh, to start today, to speak about that goal, as we've heard, of getting agriculture to $100 billion over, well, less than 10 years now, please welcome Steve Hadfield-Dodds from ABES. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. Uh, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal people, uh, and like the minister, have a shout out to Fiona Simpson and the NFF, uh, who obviously are, are helping set the agenda that we're uh, responding to and exploring in more depth uh, over today and tomorrow. But also want to acknowledge ourselves. So this is the 50th time that ABES has gathered the, the great and the good. Uh, I hope you include yourself in that phrase, uh, of the agricultural sector. Uh, and it's 75 years uh, since the Bureau of Agricultural Economics was established, one of the first uh, bureaus of its kind in the, in the world, uh, under, under John Crawford, who's now uh, a household name, at least in my circles. Um, and, and just take a moment to, to articulate what ABES is about. So like all organisations, we have a mission statement that's about uh, doing world-class analytics, collecting data, providing advice uh, to all sorts of people. Uh, and the goal of all that activity on the board there, the one goal uh, is to help people uh, achieve better outcomes through better informed decisions. So I just want to say at the outset of the conference, uh, this, this day and tomorrow is really important to us. It's a great chance for us to, uh, to talk to people, but much more importantly to listen. So if you have suggestions about things that we should stop doing, that would be fabulous. Uh, if things we should start doing, that would be okay. Things that we could do better, uh, that would be uh, excellent. So you'll see lots of people with ABEARS on their, their badge. I'll be around. Uh, please, please, please uh, come and talk to us. Um, be kind, um, but be frank. That would be fabulous. So. Oh, hold on a second. So farming uh, is, a, is a roller coaster. It was a couple of years ago now that we're celebrating uh, the best seasons on record. A few years before that, we celebrated the best seasons on records for that. Um, but, you know, that seemed a long time ago now. It's been a very hard uh, summer for, for farmers and, and um, very, very tough uh, for many rural and regional communities in Australia. And that raises some real questions about, you know, how far can we get by when? Um, but our response to that is to, is to focus on the fundamentals. So there's a lot of talk at the moment um, in the Canberra bubble and elsewhere about you know, destinations and targets and roadmaps. Um, knowing where you want to go is absolutely crucial. Okay, so this sort of discussion about where you want to go helps us to plan including plan for good years as well as bad years, uh, and helps hold ourselves accountable um, because we can't do this stuff by ourselves. No one actor can deliver on this. Uh, we need to work smart and we need to be working collaboratively. So one of the things to recognise is the target has always been ambitious. It was ambitious when it was set a couple of years ago. Um, part of the reason it was ambitious is the last 20 years trend won't get us there. And you can think about that trend in two ways. You can think about the trend including the price trend, which for Australian agriculture as a whole has been very favourable. So a lot of people in agriculture think about the cost price squeeze that I was taught about when I was in uni just a few years ago now. Um, and there's a presumption that prices, you know, have to be static or going down. So, Prices have got worse for crops. They've got worse over the last 20 years. It's been really tough. For livestock, it's been OK. Prices have been going up. Um, and in fact, 90% of our um, increase in nominal value over the last 20 years has been driven by the, that, the net benefit of those livestock prices. So we've had favourable tailwinds, and it's not clear that they will continue. ABS thinks they will for a few more years, but it's not something you can rely on. So, on top of those favourable tailwinds, we've obviously had some bad seasons. And that prompts us to think about what are the really practical things we can do? How can we take this out of the rhetoric inspiring speech box and put it into the action, let's go and undo things boxes? Uh, and it really, I've got five things on the screen. 
It really comes down to improving productivity and competitiveness. But if I only had one topic, the talk would be hard to organise. So, and so there's a range of things. They can be organised in different ways, but really I'll be talking primarily about improving productivity and making sure we're thinking about our customers and what do our customers want. So where do we start? Market reforms in Australia, by all sides of politics, have been really important in unlocking growth. They achieved a step change in productivity growth in Australia. The chart here shows um, a gross value of product, but the point is the, uh, is the same. Uh, there's that steep upward slope. So we're standing on the shoulders of giant. We have a history to be proud of and a history that we should protect uh, that's helped position farms and the farm community uh, to be competitive and amongst the best in the world. But public policy sets the stage and farmers are the actors. Policy doesn't drive productivity growth, policy unlocks, it enables productivity growth. And so the things that have been driving productivity growth, sorry, I'm not sure about my slides. Um, one of the key things in driving productivity growth uh, has been the increase in farm scale. So that farm consolidation and the increase in scale has driven more than two thirds of the increase in, in the real value of farm income. That's a, a volume measure uh, adjusted for the price changes that I was talking about before. You can see the biggest changes have been in the cropping sector, have been fighting the unfavourable price trends, um, but all farms uh, on average have, have benefited. Beef has done pretty well. Um, and it's important uh, that we stay the course on that because it's going to be important in future as well. We also need to uh, ensure the best possible innovation system. I want to be clear, our sponsors for the session, the Council of uh, RDCs, the, the system isn't broken, but the system could work even better. And in a highly competitive environment, we need to take that seriously. Uh, and one of the priorities uh, is to find low cost, practical, simple ways of improving collaboration across sectors. And the way I think about that is uh, we have a levy system for good reason. You wouldn't expect any sensible, rational farmer to invest enough in R&D if they had to do it by themselves, because a lot of the benefits would spill over to other farms. It's likely that exactly the same thing is true when you're thinking about a sector. There will be types of innovation, types of research, types of platform technologies where the benefits will spill over to multiple sectors. And so we need to find practical ways for multiple sectors to invest in that and have a stake in that. Because if we just leave each sector to its own devices, that won't happen and we'll miss out on some of the big opportunities that we need to find. In the data space, uh, it's almost hard to explain how important it is. Data is everything. If you don't have data, uh, you can't understand what's going on in your farm. You can't understand what the future might hold for you in terms of rainfall or soil moisture or humidity or uh, frost or, or, or temperatures. Or, it, you can't get to know your customers as well. You can't trace your product. You can't work out what's going well. If something goes wrong in the supply chain system, you can't trace things. So, so getting to a modern data system is crucial. The data system we have is a bit creaky. It's held together by band-aids. It was designed in the last millennium. Um, so <coughs> ABES is trying to do our bit. We're working with the ABS and other agencies uh, about creating a modern data system. Um, but by definition, that modern data system needs to be a partnership between industry and government and researchers. Uh, it can't be done by any one player alone. Uh, and I would encourage industry in particular to not wait for government. I work in government. I love government dearly. Don't wait for us. The third sort of big area for practical steps is, is how do we build our climate resilience and risk management? Now, we know Australian farms manage very high levels of variability. Australian agricultural output and the value of um, and our rainfall in agriculture areas uh, is amongst the most variable in the world. In the last few decades, uh, I've seen well documented shifts that dry years have become more frequent, and that's making the, the seasons drier on average uh, over time. We also know from ABARE's work published late last year um, <coughs> that recent um, prolonged periods of dry weather, dry seasons, uh, have had significant, substantial impacts on Australian farms. 
So Abares work done by fantastic models that I get very excited about, but I won't tell you near now. Um, that Abares work uh, demonstrates um, that the average broadacre farm has taken a hit of more than 20%. So that farm operating today compared to what that farm would have been able to achieve with its current management technologies under previous climate, you're, you're making 20% less. If you're a cropping farm, you're making 34% less. The good news is 34% less is because cropping farms are already adapting. If they weren't adjusting, if they hadn't adapted, the impact would be nearly 50%, 49% impact on cropping farms uh, over Australia on average. Uh, and you can see on the map uh, how that's distributed in terms of the, the impact on farm profits. And the science suggests that the outlook ahead is going to be challenging. So here again, uh, ABES is investing effort in being able to do the scenarios where we take those outlooks for physical variables, rainfall, climate, uh, and, and so forth, and we translate that into uh, impacts on uh, profit out, um, farm output, farm profitability, uh, those sorts of things as measures of resilience over years. You can use that sort of information to help identify uh, which uh, types of farms, which sectors, which regions face the, the biggest adaptation challenges, uh, the biggest pressures uh, under different outlooks. The outlooks aren't absolutely certain. You can also use that sort of information to guide investment decisions. And that's one thing I'll be talking about uh, a little bit. The future is not going to be like the past, so we need to think not just in terms of our forecasts, like the things we're putting out today, that where the, the name of the Outlook Conference comes from is about informing operational decisions. We also need these complementary scenario things that help uh, shape investment decisions and longer term uh, uh, adaptations. So it's as based on the best possible information. Australia is a dry country. Water resources are scarce and they're precious and we need to manage them as best we can. So water trade sometimes gets bad press. Uh, our analysis finds that the average benefit in terms of the value of output in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, is about $150 million a year. And that in really dry years, the market really kicks gold. The, um, uh, the, the value is four times that, around 600,000. That's, that's substantial benefits just by managing our, our resources better. But water markets are part of a bigger package and managing for multiple values uh, is very difficult. So, <coughs> uh, ABS finds, so obviously managing water in areas big and as complex and as variable as the Murray-Darling Basin is difficult. Some communities are concerned about water trade, moving water out of their region, which is understandable, particularly in times of drought. Addressing historical overallocation of water recovery is important. But the impacts of this feel very here and now, and the benefits of a healthy working river can feel distant. When you add to this that it takes time to achieve the expected environmental benefits, so they're tangible and you can see them in your location, makes it even tougher. Some of these adjustments are, uh, aren't going to stop yet. So water markets are complex and it can be difficult to, be, to understand. ABARES analysis finds that there's a combination of factors that are collectively putting upward pressure on water prices in the Murray-Darling Basin. The fundamental driver is simply that water markets have unlocked new opportunities. People see those opportunities and they're keen to take them and so they're willing to bid water, bid up they're willing to bid for water um, to take advantage of those opportunities. Now, moving water from its old patterns of use to new patterns of use can be disruptive, but it's also what puts food on the table for farmers and keeps the industry profitable. Now, reliable information is essential, essential for managing change and making good decisions. People can get in real trouble if they assume that future will simply be a continuation of the past. That's not going to be the case in irrigated agri agriculture, either within the basin or outside it. As the slide shows, recent perennial plantings, particularly of almonds, will help boost the value of agriculture. That's important. 
but those same almond plantings will require more water as they come to maturity and so people will be bidding up the price of water. It's going to put these and other factors we'll see an un ongoing trend <coughs> towards higher average prices across wet and dry years. This will benefit entitlement holders, but obviously will add to pressures on some farms and sectors. The last theme I'll talk about is protecting agriculture's reputation and its social licence. So the, the importance of taking a consumer view. In a competitive world, exporters need to understand their customers to stay ahead of the curve. It's always been the case that consumers want food and fibre that makes them feel good, but what that means and how they interpret that changes over time. Recent years have seen declining trust in institutions, which also makes it likely that consumers will want to verify the claims and attributes of the food and fibre they buy, just as the minister was saying in his presentation. Now farmers, particularly livestock farmers, are looking to reduce their exposure to concerns about livestock emissions and the contribution of those emissions to climate change. Take an act, taking action on this is important to protect the industry's reputation and improve its market position. We at ABARES agree there's a compelling case for the industry to ensure it has the lowest possible emissions per unit of output, often referred to as emissions intensity. The case for action on this front is likely to get stronger. This is because reducing livestock emissions is relatively difficult. And so it's inevitable that other sectors will be able to reduce their emissions more quickly and cost effectively. This makes national sense, that this makes economic sense and is good policy. It also means that the share that agriculture has of national emissions will, will rise. The example on the screen presents a scenario where Australia makes very ambitious national emissions reductions, with gross emissions falling by more than half. All remaining emissions in this scenario are offset by carbon forestry, which is great for landholders. <clears throat> Agriculture increases its total emissions in this scenario, as increases in output volumes well and truly outweigh improvements or reductions uh, in emissions intensity. But in the scenario, agriculture's sh share of national emissions more than triples, going from 13% to 41%. In that sort of context, there's more to be done. So as well as innovating and investing effort to reduce livestock's emissions intensity, Australia should be thinking about how we tell and sell the story of this aspect of industry's performance. Frankly, this is where the rubber hits the road. We see a case for Australia to lean in and for industry and government to work together to shape trade rules and approaches to verifying the food and fibre emissions and sustainability claims people make, to ensure that those claims are evidence-based, practical to implement and take account of relevant factors. The alternative, of course, is to leave these things to other players, but there is a risk they may not be as attentive to the interests of Australian agriculture. The Minister also mentioned biodiversity accreditation and payments for ecosystem services. Now, I've been working in agricultural policy on and off for three decades, and paying farmers for conservation services and, in the, and the environmental benefits they provide has always seemed to be just around the corner. Are we there yet, Dad? But I think the stars might be aligning to make this practical at scale, delivering a new source of income for farmers and a range of public benefits to the wider community. Analysis by the CSIRO, the Australian Farm Institute and others show that markets for ecosystem services, including carbon, could be very significant, with some studies finding they could boost landholder incomes by 25% or more. I think work by the Australian Farm Institute puts this in perspective nicely by pointing out that under these scenarios, carbon and biodiversity plantings emerge as the fifth largest food and fibre sector in Australia. Now, reputation is a common property resource. I apologise for jargon, but I think it's worth it in this case. What that means is that the reputation of a whole industry or sector is vulnerable to the behaviour of a small minority. Again, 
That means that each farmer having autonomy on their property is not sufficient to protect their security, to make them secure, because actions by other people on their properties can damage the value of your products and your farm. This is, this is something we know well from issues like food security, but it reminds us that uh, in the end, we're all in this together. But it will be design, challenging to design these systems. There's huge op opportunities for farmers from delivering ecosystem and conservation services at scale. It's not only about creating new sources of income. Natural systems like farming communities are under increasing pressures. One proven strategy for protecting something is to put a price on it and make it valuable. Developing new markets for ecosystem services will provide new opportunities for farmers to manage their risks and deliver new forms of value. This will be even more important in a world where established risks, such as climate variability, or maintaining consumer trust, or protecting our reputation, those risks look likely to increase over time. So having more tools in the toolkit is really important, but it will be challenging to get this right. Landscapes, farming systems, and ecosystem processes are all complex and complicated. The maps on the screen show that in some places, farms with more tree cover enjoy, enjoy higher land values. That's the livestock area in green on the left. While in other places, trees and, production and land values can be in conflict, shown in red for a cropping system. At the end of the day, I think two things are likely to be essential. First, farmers must find the system and the level of payment attractive. The system needs to be easy to navigate aligned as well as possible with how farms and farmers work, and the level of payment needs to cover the direct and opportunity costs of providing the desired services. But there's a second component, taxpayers, or whoever it is that's footing the bill, will need to be confident that they're getting value for money, that farmers are delivering real benefits, and the scheme is making a difference to the things those taxpayers care about. If we get this right, and I'm confident Australia can do it, I think all the other things will fall into place. So where does this leave us on our journey to 2030? We can be confident that the road to achieving a $100 billion industry will be challenging at times, like roads can be in rural and regional Australia. We also know it's important to identify where we want to go and how we can best get there. It's clear that growing Australia's agricultural output is challenging and, sorry, growing it to 100 billion is challenging and worthwhile. It's also clear that while past policy reforms and farm industry adjustment may have been uncomfortable at times, those things have paid real dividend to farm households, industries and the nation. So I'd like to sum up with three things that I think will be important and useful on the road ahead. First, success will require policy to remain firmly market oriented while recognising and responding to the pressures on farm households and rural communities. Second, I think it's good for us to all seek first to understand and focus on our customers and consumers, rather than only focusing on our own needs. And I want to be really clear when I'm saying that this applies to producers, to service providers, supply chain participants and public policy advisors. Third, we must always be conscious that the future will not be like the past. We need more and better information on future scenarios to support, uh, to inform investment decisions and support communities and sectors to adapt. In short, we all need to anticipate, innovate and collaborate to stay ahead of the curve. So thanks for your attention. I thought it might be useful to show how these sorts of themes and these topics are mapping out uh, across the conference. Uh, if you have a theme that lights your fire, if you follow the line across, uh, you'll see what rooms it's in. So Royal Theatre in red, Bradman in orange, Menzies in tea, and Nichols in the light blue. It's clear that Australian agriculture faces some big challenges and some even bigger opportunities. But whatever the future throws at us, I promise that ABEARS will be working to help make sense of the mess and to provide the inf information and insights you need. ABEARS is 75 years young, with 50 national conferences under our belt, 
and we're looking forward to the next 50 years. Thank you.